Hey everybody, I'm Charlie Yarber with Fixated Real Estate and we're here right now with my good buddy Mr. James Daynard with Heaton Daynard Real Estate here in Seattle, Washington. James just got done with him and his team just got done with this entire project here. Uh, you listed on the house. How much did you end up selling this for? We sold it for $2.2 million. $2.2 million in two days. In, two days two, in magic Seattle, numbers. Washington. Now, depending on where you are from, that might be an insane number, but we'll show you that this is kind of normal here in the Seattle area. How much did you end up buying this project for? So we paid seven seventy five dollars for it. And your renovation cost? It was about half mil. Half a million. $500,000 into this thing. Yep. And you held it onto it. How long did it take you to do the project? So we had this start to, from closing about 16 to 17 months. 16 to 17 yep. months. And uh, holding costs? Holding cost is uh, about ten thousand a month on this. Wow! So we about about one hundred seventy thousand in holding cost for this time. That's a lot of holding costs, right? So you sell all those things, and how much do you think you'll net at the end of it? We're gonna net close to about a half mil. Half a million, yep. six hundred, half a million. Yeah, five hundred, six hundred grand, all said and done. So would you do a project that would take you sixteen plus months to do to maybe net maybe between five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars by the time you're done? If you're interested in that, this is what this video is all about. This is not your quick flip, your quick 90-day uh, flip, cosmetic rehab. No, this is a, how, when was this house built? Uh, this house was built in 1923. And it didn't always look like this. No, right? it originally actually had duplex. Duplex. Yeah. We're going to get into that and why it was a duplex at some point, why he chose the finishes that he chose into, uh, and everything about this project as much detail as possible. So come with us as we go check at the house. Let's go check it out. Look at this freaking door. Yeah, this door was not cheap. This is a $4,000 front door. It's a $4,000 front yeah. door. So we actually, we wanted to spend a lot of time really making sure we were putting the right time of specs in here to meet, meet the kind of original craftsmanship. So this door is almost identical to the old one from the previous mm -hmm. filming. Um, so we wanted to make sure it matched so it kind of got the whole thing. That's also why we left the old numbers too. So we kind of Everything like, just... we're trying to leave the charm, but get it all functioning new and okay. that modern. Well, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people that flip houses feel like they got to like gut old houses down completely and make them all into brand new modern type style houses, right? And this house, it seems like you kind of kept a lot of the old world charm to it. Like what made you do that versus like going straight modern on everything? Well, I mean, it's the style of the home and the neighborhood. You know, my big thing is you should play into whatever architectural style that you have going on in whatever investment you buy, whether you like modern, you like craftsman, whatever that architectural style is, you need to stick with that. And also, you know, a lot of what's going on in Seattle is they're tearing down these old bungalow homes mm -hmm. and these old craftsman homes and they're building the modern, which are cool and they are in high demand, but it's also created more of a novelty for these big craftsman homes that are really well done because they want the modern updated feel with all the modern amenities, yeah. but they want the old school world charm. And for us as renovators, and you know, we do build homes too, and we build a lot of moderns, but as renovators, we really try to keep the charm. Mm -hmm. Like this house, we took all the way down to the studs, but we duplicated what was already there. Instead of keeping it, we just made it new and put it back the same way. Like the millwork is very similar to what was already in the house, okay. or the front door, or the base and the, the molding. So we, we, yeah. we put in the same style that we, we ripped out, essentially. Well, let's go check out the house and see what you're even talking about right yeah. now. So now this thing it used to all look like this, I assume. Right? Yeah. And you had was the so let's go check out the kitchen. So the kitchen obviously was fully gutted and rehab, right? This is a beautiful kitchen. But is this where it always was, or what did you guys do to this area here? No, so what this was before was French doors that came in through uh, here. We had a dining room that was actually more of it was like an arboretum. There was like two two hundred plants in here. So it was more of a plant room. Wow. It's like a greenhouse. And then what, what I didn't like was the flow was being tucked in from the front door. You can't see your kitchen. You're walking up from the staircase. You had your dining room off this. So we wanted to relocate this kind of back section. Luckily on the main, main floor, we didn't have to relocate too many things, but this was really key in my opinion. So before the kitchen was in this wall here, it was kind of through here. We opened up this section. This was a bypass to go into the dining. Mm -hmm. And we transferred everything into here, which got us a way bigger kitchen. And it got us that open uh, floor plan. Plus we get the flow out yeah. to our deck. So we get that dot dining inside outside room. So I know one of the questions that a lot of people always ask is like, you know, especially for a remodel like this, this is not a simple beginner type flip by any way, no. shape or form, yep. right? So in this particular project, like when it comes, if you were to give any advice to anybody for like, how do you even come up with a new floor plan? How do you come up with the type of finish and style that you're going to take into this project? Like, what are some advice that you would give to people to like be able to get to that level to where they can do this even on their own? I mean, the most two most important things is working with a good architect that can plan it out, mm -hmm. and then also working with a really good brokerage because 
the brokerage is going to know, or on your team, if you have a good real estate broker, they know what sells and doesn't sell floor plan wise, right? They're going to go in depth on the comparables. And you know, for us, we got a premium on this property because of the floor plan we put together. You know, we could have made it like a two bedroom, two bath upstairs, but we did a three bed, two baths. So it was very family friendly for here. We knew the kitchen had to be open in, in a different section, had to be bigger to achieve that higher, the higher price point. So it's really about working with a good sales team that can go in depth on the comparables, where the square footage is, where the bed bath counts are. It's not always just about updating. It's yeah. about making sure that you're matching what's selling in the market. Got it. So hardcore comparables as much as possible in yep. an area and then just duplicate that. Like, yeah, and then dig into those finishes on those comparables. Like I, I see a lot of people make mistakes is they'll fly through a house and they're like, oh, these are white cabinets. So I'm gonna put white cabinets in, yeah. but they maybe go with a lower grade cabinet, whereas this house, because the price point, we ended up spending about $40,000 on wow. cabinets. Well, let's look at these really quick. Uh, so these are uh, like, yeah, I'd be like six grand for cabinets tops, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's the same with me. I mean, you got some nice stuff here. Uh, real stone, you guys can do the floating shelves. Yeah. I see everything's tiled out. They, like, I would never be able to pick any of this crap out, right? Like me personally. So like, are you like, who, what about the design? Like if this was to be, you talked about architects, you talked about a broker, right? We, are you expecting like the real estate broker to help pick out all the designs too, or? Yeah, so how our at least company works and the team we work with is our, we have, we have a phenomenal staff of real estate brokers that have a, a vast experience in selling fix and flip properties and designing them, okay. whether it's a budget or high end. And what they're really good at, because if I had my, I would probably go a lot more basic. Yeah. It'd be like, hey, I'm gonna make it clean, appeal to the masses, but they add that extra flavor and charm. So our broker, uh, Katie Kepler, is who designed this one with me. She literally picked out every light fixture. She picked out the accents, farm wood island. Yeah. She adds those extra little details in to give you that custom feel. And if you're gonna be remodeling a house and selling it, and you're going for the high price point, in most of the time, the high price point in the areas, you have to go custom, right? People want unique, they don't want generic. And so that extra flavor gets you a ton on the backside. You're, you get a premium for that product. But yeah, all our brokers pick out the paint colors, the flooring, um, like even here, Katie specked out a really cool, it's, I mean, a lot of people flooring. just look at that like, oh, it's flooring. Yeah. But it's a two inch actual hardwood, which is what was in the house prior to us demoing it. We tried to save them, they just weren't saveable. So you super restored it. Yes, right? we restored it. And, yeah. and that's what they're really talented at. Doing. So it's, okay, so backing up for a second now, I get it. Your company, you're in Seattle. Like not everybody is listening to this in Seattle. There's a lot of cities that I used to invest in that didn't have anywhere near brokerages such as your company that did, uh, that does what you do. We have a lot of people that specialize in real estate investing and so forth. Um, and from my experience too, a lot of real estate brokers wouldn't even know how to do any of this stuff like at all. Uh, and there's just, it's just, you have to find those select ones. Like when I started out in real estate investing years ago, I did exactly what you said, which is I got, I tied into a real estate broker, that knew the markets I was in really, really well. And then they pulled the comps and helped me design the house and pick the finishes because I was gonna get the list back on the back yeah. so they could do it, right? But if you're kind of newer and you're starting out that way and there isn't a company like yours in their city, like what kind of, what kind of suggestions do you have for investors like that to be able to get to where they can start maybe doing things like this? So if you don't, if you, you know, a Heat Native Real Estate, we have our, our brokers are designed with or trained with design background. But if you don't have that, you know, what I would do is first thing you want to do is take a tour of all the property. If you're looking at buying an asset, go inside the comparable values that yeah. you're looking at doing. Um, good example is I just moved to Newport Beach. And, you know, part of that is I'm trying to learn the market down there. And where I might think it might cost three to 500 grand to do a project is actually one and a half million. Oh, wow. <laughs> because, and then it's like, okay, well, why is it so expensive? I had to go take a tour of all these properties, right? Because the things that make it expensive is in that market, you need to spend a hundred grand on your windows. Mm. You're going to be putting in nano doors all the way through. So you have to know exactly what you're building out there. And that, that market specifically is a good example. Cause I'll see people throw, they do more of like a generic renovation. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants it there. Real estate. It's cheap. No one wants it. They'd rather pay a premium and get the money out of it. Yeah. You're so, moving to Newport beach. Right. Yeah. And you're not like, let me go get the cheapest, crappiest place. Right. Most people. That's well, cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. yeah. And, they, and people just know, they, they know quality. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you're looking at buying that asset and you have a value in mind, go walk those properties. You need to make sure that your property is in the same quality finished project at that point. And I would think that, I mean, that goes on to any level of flip or any level yep. of the or whatever you might be doing by rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. 
uh, in any product, even multifamily, anything, any kind of value add that you're doing or you're trying to compare to get your value at a property at a certain level compared to these other properties, you got to duplicate what they did right? yep. in terms of capacity, right? Yeah. You customize it like a little bit more or whatnot uh, to, your, to your style, but it, besides luxury, luxury, right? <laughs> this is a normal house here, but for it's the, uh, you can also go too far too, right? Yeah, and honestly, the cheaper ones are the harder ones. Mm -hmm. People are like, hey, I want an easy fixer, right? Like a lot of our clients buy those, I buy those, and those take us way more time because we have to like really think about the specs we're putting in. Yeah. And then you're tight on a budget, and that's where really touring those comparables or having a broker that really knows those. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're looking at a property, it could be an old 1920s home, and if this same home had old lath and plaster walls, and they just trenched in and did the repairs, and that was the value at that point, that's what I need to do because that can be a $50,000 swing in my budget at yeah. that point. And so, uh, you know, not overspending is just as key as not underspending. So it's, it's about really nailing your plan. Okay, well, let's check out the rest of the house. Yeah. Right, so this project, you moved the kitchen here, the kitchen used to be over there, right, like we mentioned. Yeah. Uh, you have to, did you have to do anything structural on the main floor at all? Uh, structural, we did have to put in some beams here to open up this section. Yeah. Um, and so, and then this was all engineered through here too. It's all engineered. Yeah. Right. So everything's on these studs down renovations. You got to submit your plans and permits. It takes anywhere between three to four months in Seattle to get your permit. Yeah. Um, it, and then everything's backed by an architect and engineer, right? right? And then so we implement that. So this was a structural beam in here. It wasn't too bad. Like what you did to the fireplace. Yeah, and this was something that we were on the fence with because they had some old classic stone. We actually like took, uh, I posted it on my uh, social media. Of, we had people vote, replace it or keep it. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, I wanted to keep it. Yeah. But 70% of the people said replace it. And then KD trumped me. And, uh, you know, even though it's my house, I get trumped all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this turns out really good. It's very clean, very sleek. We matched the countertop with the the, uh, the hearth right here. Or not the hearth. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know my fireplace knowledge yeah. like the back of my hand. Uh, and so, you know, just tied in is very cohesive all the way through. You got the black of the black handles, the countertops match, you got the wood finish is matching that wood finish. So yeah. it's very, very balanced out. I love it. So we never talked about what you actually bought this house for. So, so what, what did you buy it for? So we are, so originally actually, and we can talk about some of this floor plan changes mm -hmm. is it was a duplex that, that was basically grandfathered it was in. It was originally built as a duplex. They lived in it as a single family house for 50 years, so it got converted to single family. It's the zone single family, they, they changed the use. Uh, we paid 750,000 for it on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, just, we were the highest bidder. Um, you know, the, how we got the deal really was we were the highest offer. And then also we gave them flexible terms. So we allowed them three months in after close, mm -hmm. which was roughly $30,000 of holding costs for us. Oh. And then we also allowed them to leave whatever remains behind, which ended up being about another $30,000 in garbage Trash. we had to take out. Yeah. Um, so it's not always about price. It's about terms too with people. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they had owned the home for a really long time. They were trying to get into a new situation, new house. You know, we wrote the offer and because we were the most flexible, we got the deal done. Got it. And so. could you, I know people might've been asking this already. So summarize the numbers really fast. Seven fifth. 775? So yeah, we paid 775 for yeah. it. Um, so originally we thought we were gonna put 250 in and yeah. then sell it for about one five. Got it. That nice. was our target numbers. So instead you put a half a million in. We, yeah, we, we in the middle, the market started going up yeah. and then our costs went up yeah. on the beginning with the demo to hold. And so we decided to switch it. We ended up doubling our budget and then we ended up selling it for 2.2. Which, do the math, that's better. Yeah, no. it's a better use of time. I know I'm going to ask this, and I know Alex is thinking it too, but the uh, uh, this was a duplex. Yes. So what made you convert it into a single family home versus keeping it as a duplex? So I actually wanted to keep it as a duplex. That was my backup plan, mm -hmm. was to just renovate as a duplex and then sell it for about 1695 But the problem is because after a certain amount of time in Seattle, if it's been used and not, if it was a duplex, it goes zoning to single family. If you're not using it, it's as a duplex, it loses grandfather status. Mm -hmm. So we tried to go in and get it passed through and they denied us. Cause in my opinion, in Seattle affordable housing is a big deal too. Yeah. So getting a nice big duplex for somebody would actually sell really well as well. And that, I, that was my initial goal, but you lose the status after a certain amount of time. So don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, and that's the, just what he just said there is very, very important because this happens, I've no investors in like Tacoma and Seattle that had thought they can keep something like this as a duplex yep. and they base their entire financials on that. And then they, the city's just like, nope, or it's a fourplex. And they're like, nope, because the use of the area has changed and it's not, and the grandfathered in doesn't continue. 
because it was being used as like a single family for years or something like that. Yeah, and that's why it was our backup plan. Yeah. So for me, if I'm buying so you knew that going in, that it might be a possibility. Yeah, we, we knew that it was probably a 50-50 shot on this one. Yeah. Uh, we had another one in Ballard that we got it done on because it was a, a rental over mm -hmm. the years part-time. Um, and so we kind of, this was more of our backup plan. In my opinion, if the numbers all went, like if we didn't get this appreciation, we didn't switch our scope, the numbers would have been a lot better as a duplex. Got it. But we had to run all of our initial numbers on a single family flip okay. because that's how you can lose a lot of money is if you're you're basically overvaluing stuff. Like people do it with rental properties yeah. too. They're like, oh, well, you can Airbnb it yeah. until you can't Airbnb it anymore. Yeah. Like and what then happens? what happens? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so, you know, if you do things non-conforming or you're looking at things in a unique way, make sure you're, that's your backup plan, not your initial plan. Agreed. I love it. So this is, this is like gold, right? So let's go continue checking out the rest of the house. Uh, and we'll get more into the numbers of the story. So, so this was a bedroom. We just started to turn into a main office, just put French okay. doors in. Very cool. Through here. Um, had, had original leaded glass French doors. We just went with more modern look. Mm -hmm. uh, with our molding, we made sure to stack it just to give it the more craftsman look. And then prior to here, there was actually a staircase that would go up to the top unit. And so your stairs came up. There, This was not here. So what we did is we, since we couldn't keep it a duplex, we demoed out the stairs and this is now our second laundry. So our main floor laundry, we put two laundries in the house in ghetto. Then reframed out this section, or this was already a bathroom, it was oversized, we kind of shrunk it down. And then this design, Katie, our listing broker, did a killer job. She kept it, you know, it, it's got that more modernized feel with the penny tile, uh, but it gives it that kind of same like original craftsman look. But then she did this two tone with the black, the taupe, the white, and then matched it up with the grout in the tile. And just those little extra details make such a big impact on the buyer. Um, but I thought she just absolutely nailed this tile right here. Oh yeah, I love that. First time I ever used penny tile on one of my projects was because you told me to. I love penny tile. <laughs> one of my projects, never done that before. Now hexagon is no, hexagon. the new penny tile. So we're not going to go downstairs for for and whatnot, but like what? How how big is this house again? Uh, so it's a total of about thirty nine hundred square feet. Thirty nine hundred square feet. Yeah. And how many do you think are below grade right now? Uh, it's about twelve hundred below grade. Okay. So and you and we talked earlier uh, before filming. You have two bedrooms down there. Yep, we got a great room. Two bedrooms, two great rooms, a bathroom, and a laundry. Wow, that was a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. So the uh, and what did it look like down there before? It was totally down to the studs, not finished space. Um, it had some pretty bad water drainage going on in there. And then also it was stacked to the brim with garbage. Wow. Or not garbage, old eclectics. Old eclectics. Old eclectics, there, there's some good stuff. Just old yeah. things that they had compiled over 50 years, but it was a ton of weight and garbage out of there. I, I definitely underestimated my trash out. I thought yeah. it was gonna be like 12 and it turned into 30. Well, that's one of the things that's like I found over the years that sometimes incredibly hard to estimate is, is, dumb, is demo and trash out at times. Yeah, like when you have, because you, you you never know. We have we have a buddy that we did a film for on on this uh, Jared Holland that was another BP uh, podcast dude, but he bought a project that uh, he opened up the garage. They couldn't get into the garage because it was completely encased in blackberry bushes, right? Yeah. And he couldn't get into it. He finally gets into it, and while we were filming, right, the live was the first time he got into the garage, and the entire thing is stacked to the ceiling of fifty pound cement bags. Right. <laughs> not joking and he loses his shit for a second like <laughs> he's like what the hell were you for a driveway huh yeah he ended up he yeah, some he, stuff he, out he but could... at the time the initial reaction oh. pallets pallets the whole thing you couldn't get in was pallets of, of cement right? yeah cement that's, concrete, right? you know they're unexpected surprises it's the yeah. weight that it's the weight it's the weight right and yeah. so how I budget that is I'll go through a house and say okay a 40 yard dumpster, there's roughly about 10 of those mm -hmm. in here, which is 800 bucks a dumpster. I know that cost. Okay. And then I'll, I'll book it at, if I think it's gonna be five labors, I just put $30 per labor, run it, the math for five days or whatever, how long, ever long it is. And then that's how I usually budget that. All right. But you guys can use that for all your investment advice when you ever need a budget. Yeah, dumpster cost 800 bucks. 800 bucks here. Yeah. Right. So what's upstairs? Uh, so upstairs, what we ended up doing, so this is what is, uh, Again, before when we when we purchased the property, it actually had a second kitchen, and then it was two bedrooms and a little living room. So it was a, it was a legitimate second floor unit, and then the staircase actually came up right through here. So we ended up reframing this whole structure out up here uh, because we really wanted to maximize out the layout. You know, in Seattle, getting three bedrooms, two bath on your main top floor is kind of rare. 
Uh, a lot of the footprints are a little bit tighter, so you get a two bedroom, two bath upstairs, and then maybe a one, one on the main and two, one in the basement. So we wanted to really optimize and give us a novelty factor. We ended up reframing this whole section out. This became our master. So we got a really big size master, and then we ended up redoing this whole thing, which was more of like an undercover porch that we ended up finishing in. We did have to rebeam this whole section through here because this beam came down to almost my head height. And at that point, it was just too funky of a space. So we had to jam up. This beam was actually pretty expensive. It's 2,500 bucks. And we wanted to get this as much as open as possible because in the wintertime, you actually get a pretty good Bellevue view. Uh, Bellevue is a city. Yes, Bellevue, <laughs> Bellevue is my favorite city in Washington, but um, it's, uh, you know, having that view was, and that was something we didn't really expect when we bought it. Um, it gets you about a five to 10% push too. Mm -hmm. So the better the view, it gets you top premium out of here. So we really wanted to sp make sure that we could get a, a shot of that. We also have it out of the kitchen too. Now, since the trees grew in in the last month, literally, so we're getting ready to list it. I'm like, yeah. oh shit, where'd my view go? Yeah. But luckily you can still kind of peek a boot. You see, there's water right there. Look at that. Pano views. Right to that bush. Trust us, it's there. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. But yeah. Now so, so and isn't Rainier somewhere? Yeah, and then Rainier, you have a killer shot of Rainier down there. It's just yeah. a nice Seattle, typical cloudy day. Yeah, if you don't if you don't if you're not from Seattle, right, there is a big ass mountain over there that comes out twice a year when there's no clouds. So I think there's only two days this year. So it is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Right. It sucks here. Anyways, <laughs> that's one. Um, the, so something that I didn't bring up earlier or even ask about, and I know people might be thinking about this, is that this front, nobody lives here, right? Yeah. And so this is all staged furniture. And something that I know I've learned, and I know you've learned too, is that like staging can make a huge difference on a sale. Huge difference. Yeah. I mean, and we're brokers too. So sometimes we're fortunate enough to where our clients will stage the property themselves. Mm hmm and it just doesn't quite look it honestly so if you're gonna do my opinion if you do a half-assed stage don't do it at all yeah like either do it or don't do it like because if it looks half-assed it looks like a crack house in my yeah. opinion like you got the deflated mattress it just doesn't feel good mm -hmm. and so and then also when you are selling a property you need to match the stager with the project so our typical staging cost for a house in seattle is 2200 to 2500 and that gets us about 60 days yeah this staging cost is about six thousand per month, yeah, or five to six thousand per month, because they use actual yeah, real I mean, furniture. Look, look at the yeah. detail, right? It's like it's insane what they're doing. And this is quality furniture it's, versus this is not an air mattress. Yeah, that's and they, a real mattress. In this company, I'll give them a shout out. Seattle Swank. They do an incredible job mm -hmm. in Seattle. Uh, they do only high end. Don't try to finagle with them because they don't finagle. No, Quality doesn't finagle. You want it or not. Uh, <laughs> I tried, yeah, I gave up. Uh, but they do an amazing job. It makes the home feel warm. And when people are walking into a restored home, they want to make it feel like their own. Yes. Um, so this here was a little bit complex. I literally had to inch this over. So the hallway was actually six inches more, but because we, we really wanted a master mm -hmm. walk-in, this is the best we could do. We spent more money on some custom shelving, but I came out here three times to inch it out. Just this. Because this is such an important space for the master bedroom, I yeah. didn't want to screw it up. Because originally when they framed it, it was right at this door jam. Mm. And what am I going to do with a closet this size? Yeah, you're not going to do that. No, and people do make that mistake all the time. Like, yeah. well, the closet's there. Well, you can't use it. If you can't yeah. use it, it's not there, in my opinion. So we got enough space here. And then the house does have some extra, um, it's more storage on this side. But this was the one thing we really had to inch out. We were running into this problem because of how the house is framed. That this was the best we could do with this bathroom because we also wanted the big nice master bathroom so you can see in all the tile and the flooring specs this is not your typical flip product you know you got tile that's more around eight bucks a foot your your this tile right here is about fifteen dollars a foot you know typically most of my flips i'm spending about two bucks two to four uh, and then this is where you know we did an actual stone rather than ceramic so just like those little details buyers do notice quite a bit and then we did the frameless glass shower door, which costs about a thousand bucks more than the uh, semi frame. So, let's do this door. Yeah, it turned out really good. Yeah, I like it. So, in a perfect world, I would have got a five piece bath in here, but there just wasn't the space, or we're going to have to put it in there and lose our view. Mm, but so, it's kind of like bigger bathroom or closet or view. Yeah, and how many people, I mean, as much as we, I mean, five piece bath, five piece bath is awesome. But usability, I mean, most people are just going to use the walk-in shower to get a take two. I personally always want showers in my masters. Yeah. I'd rather, I think it's much, it, unless you only have a one-bath house, 
having that huge shower in the master, like, I mean, at least that's my own preference. I like yeah. having the shower going too. I think most so, of them that way. Yeah. yeah. So cool. All right. Well, that's awesome. As you can see, all the bathrooms are very cohesive with the light fixtures. They all have their own different style of tile, but we kept things like light fixtures, fixture, bathroom fixtures. Those are all cohesive. This is a second bedroom. Again, this one we had to inch out to. So here, this was actually crawl or no, attic space. Attic space. Yeah, this was attic space. Tell from the yes, from the beam. So to get this third bedroom in, this is stuff that we had to put in this beam, reframe this out, and that spending the extra money on this framing for this top floor was probably an extra five to eight grand. And it was well worth it to get that three bed up. If we would have done a two bed, two bath up, we in a little flex, we probably would have sold this for more like one nine to one nine nine. So having that very functional family house was really important to us. Wow. Then we did all solid wood doors, high, uh, upgraded fixtures. We rebuilt this whole railing system here to match kind of more of that original style. And this bathroom turned out really good. This is our, our kids' bath. Again, so as you can see, we switch up the styles. You know, we still got the same type of stone. It's a natural stone, a little different color. We still kept with that penny, penny tile theme throughout, but we switch it just subtly. So then it gives each bathroom has its own unique characters with the same style in general. And right here, the nicer, bigger bedroom. And you got the beautiful view. One of the best things about living in a city. Yeah, you can touch your roof. You got yeah. almost rooftop deck. So one of the things that I think is interesting, depending on, a, I actually want to bring this up just because oh, you look at, you look at the roofs here, right? You see the neighbors. Uh, and you can see there's a little apartment complex there across the street over there. There's new stuff like this is a really tight in neighborhood. Yeah. Right. And this you're selling this for 2.2 million. Right. But that doesn't mean this is when it comes to back to the comparables and comps and knowing your neighborhoods really, really well, or your market really well. Like if you're in Scottsdale, Arizona or Phoenix, Arizona, right. It's incredibly different, different when you're in a city area like especially Seattle area or like San Francisco or some sort of, you know, metropolitan area on the East coast, uh, to be able to compare. Cause a lot of people will pull, oh, let's go a half mile radius for comparables and like whatever I find that's good enough. Right. And yeah. so what kind of advice can you give on giving like how to pull comps or know your, or know your market area a little bit better? Because I promise you that house isn't 2.2 right? at that point. That no. house isn't even and there's a huge variance. Huge. And it, what that comes down to is working with the right broker that knows the market. True. So, you know, luckily for me, I worked at Red Robin, I knocked doors. I knocked doors in the CD in Cap Hill for the last 16 years, mm. right? Since I was 22 years old, I've been knocking doors in this area. Um, so I know every little street, we've seen it grow. We own, uh, you know, in my bigger pockets at, at episode, we talk about the rental properties we own. Yeah. We have over hundred units in Cap Hill and kind of the CD. So we know the area really well, but you have to, on these primo areas, whether it's Capitol Hill, Newport Beach, wherever it is, you have to go street by street, block by block, mm -hmm. right? Because if we go, even if we just drive five minutes this way, not far, that could be 15% less. Wow. Or the further we get into towards, like uh, more towards Leshi, which is another neighborhood, that's where the pricing can drop another 10% there. Yeah. And so you really have to know your market and just, you know, before you commit to any type of deal or that you're buying, double check, triple check, make sure your values are right. You know, make sure that you got the same type of asset. How we came up with this value here because it was a tricky comp is we actually blended. There was some new construction over here. And so once I saw those hit last year, two, one, mm. I knew that this street could then support it because there had been nothing in this block at two, two or in the two million yet. Yeah. And so it's about knowing every little street. And we did. We had some brokers say, hey, this is overpriced. And we had to send them the information. They're like, oh, okay, we're wrong. Yeah. Right. Because they just, they drive the block and they're like, well, this doesn't feel like two and a half million. Well, that's what it is now. Yep. Right. And so, and I, love, I know we've been talking about brokers a little bit on this one. And uh, I know as a real estate investor for myself, I don't, I would, if even if I had my license, I would never list a freaking house because I don't want to deal with buyers and stuff. Uh, but for the, but that said, uh, it's so important, in my opinion, right? And I think James is important. It's, it's so important to work with like hardcore professional real estate brokers when in for flipping houses, right? Uh, discount brokers are great if you know the house is like gonna like just sell without you even doing anything whatsoever. But you get those tiny touches. Like for me, I can't do my business without a solid broker uh, because they help me pick out the finishes. They help me know the comps are gonna be the stuff. I have another set of eyes to know that this is gonna be a solid thing and they're gonna get the list back so they have a vested interest in making sure you're doing it right because they wanna sell it for what you need to sell it for. You're building these relationships. They send you more deals. Like it's 
It's so important to have a good relationship with those. And even on bigger pockets, I think they even have a premium feature now. Uh, so those premium members on BP, I think most of those guys are real estate brokers, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're premium, yeah, right? We're so premium. you can find them on there. So it's like, it's an important feature. And if you're a real estate broker uh, listening to this right now and you want to be more advocated toward the premium side of bigger pockets, you could do that because you'll get more pushed as far as showing like, hey, I'm a professional in this industry, in this business, and so get possibly more clients. Right, and more deals, right, depending on who you are. Yeah, we're, we're brokers that specialize in, like, mm-hmm. we do investments. If you came to me and said, hey, I want to go look at a bunch of primary houses and I need to go look at 30 homes, that's not my specialty. No. I'm going to give that to a different broker. Yeah. Or if we have a 100-unit apartment building, we do sell multifamily, but, you know, the 100 to 2 unit, 100, that starts to require a specialty type yeah. of eyes. You know, and so hire that person that knows what they're doing on that. Yeah. You know, I, I, as a broker, it's really important for me to always just give off the business that I shouldn't be servicing. I like so, it. So, uh, let's check out some more stuff. For time's sake, right, we're gonna go in briefly into the numbers. All right, how long did you do this, pro- how long did it take you to do this project? About 16 months. 16 month yep. project. So we had to earn it. Make 600 grand, right? Yep. Plenty of work involved, right? You weren't swinging the hammer though. And you're yeah, just managing it, it, earning it, going through it, right? Managing <laughs> yeah, contract. I hurt myself. Yeah. So a lot of times people are like, you, this isn't a 90 day flip, right? So yeah. it's the, there's a lot of more work, a lot more detail that goes into these projects, which is why that reward is there potentially. Now you would never do this size of a project if your potential reward was like 50 grand, right? No, because it all, for me, it's always about cash on cash return. Mm-hmm. So we made, and we got some upside because of COVID actually helped us out in this market with Amazon going up like crazy stocks, uh, rates are down. So the, the market has gone up 10 to 15% in the last three months here. Um, but for like on a normal project, I'm usually trying to make about 40 to 50% cash on cash return with leverage in there or about 15 to 20% yeah. with no leverage. So if you really look at it and I can do those projects in six months, it's really no different than doing three projects, right? If I'm making 50% return, but yeah. I'm stacking it, that's 150% return over 18 months yeah. and I'm at 200% here. Okay. So one fallacy that a lot of people have is like, oh, the big projects make you all the money which you can make money on, but the small projects will consistently give you income through it too. So we do, we do a variety of both. Yeah, you have to, like a lot, there's a lot of builders that I know or people that get into bigger projects like this that wish they never got out of the smaller projects so they can get capital and revenue and so forth coming in. Yep. Because this takes 18 months or 16 months, right? But you got to feed yourself throughout the whole time if you, this is your, how you make all your money, right? And yeah, during an 18 month project, that could be 18 months of permitting issues. Yep. They could be 18 months of construction costs. Like over a two year period, construction costs have gone up 30% in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. So your budget can get shredded on these long ones because you're like, well, my cider was doing it for 10 bucks a foot and I was 12. Wow. My painter was a dollar and I was yep. two. So you can, there's other variances in and there. And they're not essential, so you get shut down, right? Yeah, so, we've been yeah, shut down good. numerous times here. Yeah. yeah. So. so. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? Good. <laughs> We're good. All right, let's keep rolling. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, okay, there you go. That's staying in. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about the numbers now with you guys, right? This business is serious. This is serious. We're talking about money now, okay? Stop laughing at us or him. All right, so we told you guys the numbers briefly early in the beginning. Do you want to start No, out? I want to keep going, going, right? This is good. We can knock this out. Any of this crap do out, anything. right? So leave all this, even me talking to you, right, Mr. Camry guy. Okay, so, Jimmy. Yeah, James Daynard, uh, who was on our episode 338 of the Bigger Pockets podcast. Check it out. Red Robin Raider. Red Robin Raider. All right, so you purchased this house. Remind us again, how much did you purchase it for? We paid seven seventy five for the property. You paid $775,000 as purchased. That's a lot of money, right? This yeah. was a duplex. Right. It was a duplex. It was a single family house that was built originally as a duplex. duplex. Yep. Got it. Okay. So renovation, rehab for sure. I spell rehab. Rehab. A rehab was 500,000. Roughly 500,000. That's a lot of rehab, but as you guys saw throughout the video, there's a lot that got done and it's all higher in quality, right? Yeah. It was about 120 bucks a square foot. Uh, That's including building the garage. That's almost like in some parts of this world, that would build you a brand new house. Yeah. Right? So rehab. So you have holding costs. Now your holding costs for everybody listening, holding costs is your, uh, it's going to be your, your, your hard money costs, your finance costs, it's going to be utilities. It's going to be pretty much like anything that you property have to pay taxes. on property taxes. Yeah. And your, anything on a regularly recurring basis that you have to pay for holding the property. Right. Yep. And also, and we'll talk about resale costs separate. Right. 
So holding costs over the course of 16, 17 months. So the, the lending cost was about 170,000, mm -hmm. uh, 160, 170,000. Then we had another probably 15,000 in utilities, taxes, insurance during that time, and then staging another 8,000. So roughly that's, uh, I lost my math. Well, staging, about staging, 100, staging. About, about $190,000 in total cost. Okay, okay. so roughly 190,000, yep. right? And, all right, so roughly 190, right, give or take. And so the so holding costs. Then you got selling costs, right? So yep. sale, selling costs, sale costs. Now in the Pacific Northwest, or specifically in Seattle uh, and Washington in general, we have something called excise tax, right? So we don't pay state income tax, but we pay excise tax when we sell property. So traditionally forever, it's been 1.78% of whatever you sell the property for, right? And now, the state of Washington has changed the laws to be based on how much you sell the property for and then a percentage on that, right? So yeah. this was sold for 2.2 .2 million. 2.2. So your excess tax is like 2 point something percent. Yeah, it's like 2.1% yeah. roughly now. Okay, so, so you have that. Into effect. And you have real estate agent commissions. So roughly give a number what your selling cost was just to sell the property. So we had 6% real estate commissions, yep. three and three, we had about 2.1% excise tax. Uh, and then we, because we do a lot of volume, we do get discounts on escrow right. and title, but typically it's about 10%, it's called 10%. at the end of the day. So it's about 220,000 on this project. So 220,000 to sell, right? So, that's, so just everybody watching this, especially if you're newer, right? People forget about that part. It costs a lot of money to sell the project, yep. right? And that's why some people go like, oh, I need to get my real estate commission as cheap as possible. We talked about that in this video too. We need to do everything as cheap as possible, which sometimes that's great to go do for yep. sure. Right, but there's a, then you also are getting what you pay for as well on a real estate broker side, in my opinion. So 10%, 220,000 to sell a $2.2 .2 million house. Right, you add all that up. It's right? crazy that this right here is more than what yeah, we paid for the property. Paid for the house, that's right? insane. Our costs were about 120% of purchase. That's incredible. So you got 690,000 there for these two things, plus 220, so that's eight, that's nine, 10, right? Yeah. So 910,000 in costs. Plus 70, so let's just do that really quick. That's how you write that down. Uh, and cost plus 775. 1.67. Huh? 1.67. Yep. 1, 6, 7, 5. Yep. Right. 5. All right. So in cost. $1.67 million in cost. You sold it for 2.2. 2, 2, 2, 0. It's all in alignment. It works out. Yeah, right. it was terrific. So it looks great. So four hundred five. What is that? Uh, five hundred twenty-five thousand. Yep. So five hundred and twenty-five. Here, I'm just gonna do this just for more dramatic effect. Five hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars profit. Ish. Woo! -hoo. Yeah. Right. You guys want that? You guys good on that? Buy our course. No, I'm joking. We don't have courses. Uh, the uh, that's what a seminar dude would say, but that's it. So five twenty five long term project worth the value of it cash on cash return. So cash on cash. So our total cash outlay on this was about we had three hundred thousand to put down when we purchased it, and we had another one hundred eighty in, in closing cost or in, in carrying cost. So uh, about three hundred thousand down. Three hundred thousand dollars down payment. Uh, so you had to put three hundred thousand dollars down payment to your lender. To the lender, and the yep. lender finances all of our construction costs back at that point. Out of pocket, right? There you go, pocket. And then we had the hundred and ninety in carry. Hundred ninety in carry came out of your pocket. Came out of our pocket to carry the loan, carry for the expense. So we're out of pocket about half a million dollars. Okay. So yeah, call it four ninety, right? And so, so that's your cash out of pocket, right? But your return is over hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. So on a semi or on an annual basis, it was about a seventy percent return deal. Seventy percent annualized. Yeah. Right. So you had seventy percent annual ROI. Right. So cash on cash. And so one thing to note on these big fixer deals that we we do do we you know we try to diversify how many houses we flip. We do some quicker ones to bring in quick income. We have some bigger ones. But at the end of the day, it always ends up being around the same ROI, mm -hmm. right? So if we're doing a quick fixer one, typically we're targeting 30 to 40% in five months, five to six and months. So your cash out of pocket. So yeah, with cash out of pocket. So our cash return on that, so annualized, mm -hmm. that's about 
Yep. So like even on a quick flips, it's really no difference on an annual basis because yeah. usually we can do two quick ones in the time we can do, actually we do three quick ones in the time of this typically. Yeah. So you know, the big projects are great because you do get a lot of upside, it's a big profit infusion, but at the end of the day, you're really making the same amount of money yeah. as a base hit deal as well. And that's, and that's, yeah, because you're, but you're doing it one versus three. Yes. Right? It's very so, efficient. So. You don't have to manage many people. Mm -hmm. You get to spend time and you get to put out really good quality product, which is nice, right? Yes. I mean, we all have to cut costs in certain areas, but you know, for this, when you have a bigger budget, you can just kind of get it out. You know, you can do it the way you want to do it at yeah. the end of the day. Versus shaving the fact that you don't want to put real natural hardwoods in, you put laminate in or stuff. Yeah, exactly. Day, right? So the, so those, those are great factors because one of the things I've seen with a lot of real estate investors over the years that like go from flipping a bunch of houses to doing these is that one of their mistakes that they sometimes make though is that they go directly into doing a larger project like this, which they make a bigger outlay. They only have to focus on one project, which is great, but this takes 16 to 18 months to get this project yeah. done. And a lot of that's because of permanent and whole you know, permitting time that you just can't like control, right? But you still need to eat, right? Yeah. So some of those guys then go, I wish I would have still done a 90 day flip or done a few little you know, smaller projects to keep things going. So it is a balance depending on what you focus on. But there's dudes out there uh, and ladies that only do this type of style right. and they like doing a project every, you know, two or three of these a year and they just kind of like do their thing or even one a year and they just, you know, move on to the next. It's a lot more systematic to yeah. do one. But, you know, typically on average, we do about 50 to 60 flips a year. We were doing 100 and I would say 10% of them are about this size. Yeah. And then the rest are mid grade, which are gonna pay off in six to nine months. Yeah. And then we have our quick ones, which we can get down to three to four months. Yeah, but those, those are the best ones. Oh so, yeah, make, yeah. make 20 grand, 20, yeah. 30 grand, yeah. move on, you're out. Yeah. Yep. And so, and I found myself niched out over the years of going that mid grade six to nine month stuff is what we've been stuck in for the last couple of years personally. Yeah. And, and I love when we find one that just all of a sudden we get down to 30 to 40, 30 to, sorry, three months to four months and it's just done. I'm like, that's amazing, <laughs> it's great. And usually Excellent. you barely have to go to this one. Yeah, barely, never have yeah. to go to it. So, so. Uh, but everybody wants those. And yes. that's why there's not that many of them. And that's yeah. why the margins are not 70% on those most of the time. So uh, that's it. How do they find out more about you? Uh, so you can check me out on my social media. It's uh, J Dane Flips, J-D-A-I-N-F-L-I-P-S. Or you can check out my Bigger Pockets episode at 388. I talk a lot more about buy and holding rather than fix and flipping. Um, and uh, you can also check out our company website, which is www.heatandaynard.com. And uh, yep. And so episode 338 is an amazing episode. It's the second best episode. First best episode, Big Pox, episode 189. Check it out. It's my favorite one. Uh, that said, you can also follow me at Tarl Yarber on Instagram, our company Fixated Real Estate, Fixated RE. Make sure you comment, like, subscribe this on YouTube and follow Bigger Pockets. Go check out their website. Go check out what they have on their pro site as well. Uh, for people out there, there's tons of people like us on Bigger Pockets scrolling it, being able to help out other investors all for free. Uh, it's just something that we like to do. So we'll see you guys in our next video.